So I'm going to structure this second lecture around some of the fundamental arguments and points that Fry makes in the secular scripture, but I'm also going to pull out the logic of some of those points and talk about it in more detail, and then we'll see how all of this connects to this concept of Irish literature, which we really need to get our heads around before we're going to understand exactly what happens to Old English and Middle English in several centuries down the road, which is where we're going, okay? So if we return back to our old Canadian friend here, Arthur Fry in the secular scripture, and we revisit that idea that cultures and civilizations have stories and that those stories are important, there are some uh, logical implications to that statement. And, and the statement is that the logical implications are, or one of them is anyway, that when a society changes, uh, the stories will change. Um, what Fry tells us, though, is that when the stories in a society change, they don't just simply, a society just doesn't get simply new stories. So it's not like a society simply gives up all of its long-standing beliefs and values. Rather, the old stories are, are transformed and we begin to see them in the new stories. They're kind of absorbed by the new stories, almost like the, you know, the new civilization, the, the, the developing civilization is kind of a blob that kind of overtakes the previous, um, the previous civilization. And this is very apparent um, in a number of uh, stories that involve the lives of the saints. Um, in the Catholic tradition in Europe, as well as certainly long sections of both the Old and New Testament, many of which quite intentionally call to mind, uh, you know, stories that were significant to previous civilizations uh, and previous uh, previous cultures. It's arguably one of the reasons why, you know, at the beginning in the New Testament, we have a claim that there will be no other gods before, you know, the God of of um, the God of Abraham and Moses, and that's because. Um, you know, there are other gods out in the world at the time in the sense that there are other storytelling traditions that are significant to different reasons. But the Catholic Church was very, very wise and smart in how it dealt with the many cultures it kind of uh, came across and became part of uh, in the centuries following the fall of the Roman Empire. And it was primarily done through the partial absorption of what we might call pagan rituals, pagan cultural traditions. Pagan is not a good or very nice word necessarily, but um, particularly in the sense that it's originally used. But there's this incorporation of the, the tales, the beliefs, you know, the stories, the legends, the myths that are significant to various regions in Europe uh, during the first millennium and a lot of the Catholic traditions that become established and developed and refined and made more appealing to different people uh, across Europe at this time. That's really important for where we're going in the course because we're shifting our focus now to what your Norton anthology is calling Irish literature. And it's a, that's a really hard phrase to take. Um, if, if anybody who might be Irish uh, or anybody who has you know knowledge of what it meant to be labeled as Irish, specifically in America uh, in the early 20th century or 19th century. Um, so we're just going to hold that designation at arm's length, okay? Uh, and we're going to say that this is really a section of the text that makes us think about the Celtic people and Celtic traditions um, and the significance of of, of Celtic people and, and societies moving across Europe at about the same time that Bede is writing his, you know, version of Cade Mon's hymn, and about the same time that there is this general sudden recognition of the significance of Old English to, you know, the Catholic faith and, and how it can be used as a tool to spread Catholic uh, beliefs and doctrines uh, to more and more people at the time, okay? So, during about the same time, um, we have uh, the movement of large groups of Celtic people, people kind of originally associated with the area that we would identify as Ireland today, okay, uh, parts of it which were never conquered by the Roman Empire. In fact, they lived beyond the wall of the Roman Empire uh, and over there lived quite well, developing their own uh, cultural traditions, their own societal values, their own stories, and that's the key uh, term here, but they also had their own language. And largely, we know this from, um, from various historical records, however, we also are very much aware that the Celtic language at the time, or the, the, the languages we're hearkening back to, were largely oral. Uh, so that means that much of it is lost. But just like, or just as, you know, a, a text like Beowulf in Old English gives us some insight into the significant stories of people who come from oral storytelling traditions who no longer exist, we do have enough documentation kind of floating around to be aware of at least the richness and the significance of the Celtic people's storytelling tradition uh, before uh, societies began to employ writing and prose as a means for, for holding stories down on paper and disseminating them through 
a society. Okay, why is this important? It's important for a couple of reasons. I, I got to the main point five minutes in, so that's pretty good. Why is it important? It's important because at about the same time that all this stuff is going on with Bede and the writing of his, you know, uh, his works, we have the Celtic language and Celtic, Celtic speakers traveling all over, you know, uh, what we consider Western Europe and certainly all over, um, you know, the, the, what we identify today as the United Kingdom. And they're bringing with them their stories. And these stories, um, a number of them have the, the, the seeds that will be used by later storytellers to develop the, the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which for many people is kind of the defining uh, myth, the defining story of the English tradition. And it's a story we're going to spend a lot of time with this semester. And we're going to see it in many different ways, and we're going to kind of follow its development across time. Um, that might not be evident to you in the very short little poems uh, that I had you read for today, um, but it is, it, is in, it is in the early Irish literature. So we have this language kind of floating around um, with different groups of people moving across the, essentially the same region, okay, at the same time. And one of the things that Old English starts to absorb, starts to kind of make its own and retranslate are some of these older Celtic um, myths and legends. Okay, um, the Celtic people are also going to write down their own, you know, uh, versions of these. And so I'm not trying to suggest that they have not curated their own history, but it's certainly uh, these stories, these poems, these observations are certainly significant to people who were reading and were you know, developing Old English at the time. So if we're thinking about, you know, how languages begin to interact, one of the things to understand about English literature is one of the reasons it looks the way it does um, over the next several centuries in terms of the stories that people tell is because of its early association with the Celtic tradition. Okay, um, so Fry really says a lot of things in his book that anticipate this kind of social situation. What he basically talks about is how when you have a, a society expanding or an empire expanding or something like that, one of the things that almost always happens is it begins to incorporate um, stories, traditions, perspectives from the different cultural groups it comes into contact with. That tends to be uh, very normal. So when a new society kind of develops, it's not the case that it um, simply creates all of its own new stories. Let, let me give you a good example of that. Some of you know early American literature, okay, and uh, you know about the Puritans and other early settlers on the eastern coast of contemporary, what, what is today contemporary, you know, uh, uh, in the United States and also parts of North America. When they showed up, they didn't, they didn't suddenly develop new stories. Um, what they carried with them were old stories from their homeland, and they used those old stories to interpret the new world they found themselves in. So, for example, the Puritans are deadly afraid of witches. They're deadly afraid of demons. They're deadly afraid of the devil being in the woods near their settlements. Why are they so scared of these things? Well, these things feature quite prominently in a lot of the uh, legends and stories and myths that they value so much through their own particular interpretation of the Christian tradition. So it wasn't like they showed up in America, set up a couple of houses, raised a barn, and developed brand new stories. They were interpreting this new landscape and these new people through, through their old stories. However, that interpretation is uh, warped and changed and modified by the people that they begin to interact with. So for example, and very unfortunately for the Native American tribes that they encountered, there is a, you know, this horrible association for the Puritans and other early European settlers of the uh, Native people with all of these, you know, terrors that are anticipated and suggested uh, will come about in the, in, the, in the New Testament before, you know, the end of time and, and the resurrection and all of these issues. Uh, and that's precisely because old stories are meeting new content and they're starting to mesh with each other. It's also because of racism and all kinds of other things, but that's the basic reason why it happens. When we look at the um, relationship between Old English and the Celtic people, what we kind of see kind of slowly over time is this appropriation of the basic concepts of society, how people should be organized, what, what is a king, what is a ruler, how should people live in this new kind of post-Roman post-Latin environment where you have very quickly, as we'll see in our next unit, a number of distinct uh, you know, um, nations, tribes, people kind of crowding into and trying to race out of 
um, the geography of present day United Kingdom. And out of all of that, we get this exchange of cultural traditions. So we'll get the Celtic traditions and we'll get the kind of, you know, messy, not yet quite formed old English perspective, which will be transformed into something very new. And a large part of that something new is the, um, the legend of Arthur. Um, the, the, the Knights of the Round Table, which some of you might be aware of, um, you know, generally. Um, I was surprised last semester in the history of the English language class how few students knew the story of Arthur. Um, that would have been very different 10, 20, 30 years ago, and certainly for a number of centuries before that. But you will learn it this semester uh, because we'll be reading a number of examples of, uh, of the story. The story of Arthur is important for a bunch of reasons, um, one of which is that it provides kind of a uh, practical um, uh, representation of the myth of the myth of the life of Jesus, um, in a sense that it relates to power structures in Europe at the time and what it means for a king to be a king and all of those kinds of things. So I'm not going to get sidetracked on that right now. It would be really easy to, but I'm not going to get sidetracked on that right now. What I want to do now in the second half of this video is turn to the actual things I asked you to read uh, for the canonical lecture. Okay, so in the canonical lecture. Uh, we have uh, the canonical reading, excuse me. We have just simply four um, little, very short pieces. We have the scholar and his cat. We have the scribe in the woods. We have the Lord of creation. And my hand is weary of writing. Uh, that final one might be great for English students to put next to their computers as we get closer to the end of the semester. But one of the interesting things, you know, if you think about Cademon's hymn and what Cademon's hymn supposedly was, right, which is this this explosion of uh, Old English verse that is uh, a translation of Latin biblical, you know, tradition and all of that. One of the fascinating things about these little selections is that, you know, with the notable exception of uh, the Lord of Creation, there's not much of a theological uh, overtone here or focus or concern. I'm particularly focused on the scholar and his cat which is simply a um, short little piece about a man thinking about how his work relates to the work of a cat he's observing. Now this is, you know, we live in a society that is saturated with cats and with cat cultures on the internet and breading videos and all, all those kinds of things. So I think we really need to kind of step back a little bit from the kind of infantilization of animals that we have in contemporary society. Uh, and we might just think about it with a little bit more of a, of a colder eye, but there's a sense here that the scholar is thinking about how his work could be associated with the work of the cat. And the work of the cat is largely violent, right? The work of the cat is to find the mouse and, and, and fight the mouse and kill the mouse and apparently take some joy in that exchange. And that struggle and its outcomes are, for the scholar, very similar to what he's doing as he's considering an idea, as he's trying to think about how things relate to each other. So it's a really interesting analogy for a bunch of reasons, primarily because we have a human perspective trying to see uh, an association of, you know, the speaker's life with the activities of the cat. And absent here is any necessary, you know, theological framework. Absent here is really any reference to uh, a divine being who organizes and justifies these things. It's just the scholar and the cat coming to know each other. And I think this is probably for a bunch of different reasons, but one of the most important is that we just have this this, this, this freedom in the language, because it's a much older language, it's much more developed, it has much more tradition behind it, uh, it's a much more um, um, useful language, frankly, at the time, in terms of its social significance and the geography that it covers and the people that it influences on a day-to-day -day basis. So it has all these things going for it uh, that Old English really doesn't at the time. So it's kind of hard to hold them hand-in-hand uh, -hand and, and line them up and say, you know, which is the better language. But when you, when you start to compare it um, to what you see in The Wanderer, or what you see in The Dream of the Rude, or what you see in uh, those kinds of works, we begin to get the sense that here we have two very powerful uh, languages for describing the world people find themselves in. Um, and then there are some other, you know, very shorter ones. Obviously, The Lord of Creation, you know, comes to us uh, with a very Christian perspective involving, you know, heaven and all of those kinds of standard images um, in the Christian mythos. But here we have, again, this sense that there's this other language floating around out there. Now, we're going to be introduced to it, another language in the next unit, and that is French, which is also going to have a significant impact on, um, on Old English as we transform it into Middle English and then keep moving up the chain uh, of being, as it were. Um, so just be, be aware of that as well. So as we come to the end of this second lecture, 
what I really want you to understand is that when cultures come into contact with each other, there are consequences for their storytelling traditions. Storytelling traditions tend to be absorbed by the dominant, oftentimes invading culture, which will appropriate um, aspects of a storytelling tradition uh, into its own um, established stories. Okay, and there's a range of reasons for this, um, but as people kind of come together to form a new society that's composed of their now joined, you know, civilizations, you'll see a transformation in their stories. Uh, and this is the theme we're going to see throughout this semester. It's going to be particularly significant when we get to Chaucer and how it is and why it is Chaucer brings so much to the English language. It's because he went to France. But we'll talk more about that uh, in the future. Um, so there we are with that. Uh, this brings us to the end of the second lecture. Um, and um, the apocryphal readings are, are listed. Um, I would strongly recommend, um, uh, uh, I would strongly, strongly recommend uh, Cachulin's Boyhood Deeds, which is only a couple of pages, um, and I really should have made it a canonical reading, but I, I left it off. And if you read that, you'll have some sense of what I'm talking about when I, said, when I say that this storytelling tradition is significant to the rise of the Arthurian legends. Um, so take a look at that and think about that a little bit. Otherwise, keep up the good work, and I'll speak with you soon.